Okay, my name is Steve Hudgens. I'm uh, Director of Investigations for MUFON. That's the Mutual UFO Network. And uh, we are here at the Paranormal Expo, talking and inviting people to join MUFON. And uh, we have a radio show, the uh, Mutual UFO Network radio show, and we broadcast each Tuesday night at 6 o'clock uh, Central Time. And it's a one-hour show, and you can find it on the Internet at kgraradio.com. I'm field investigator Thomas Diamond. Uh, I'm a field investigator for MUFON. Uh, I've been with MUFON now for about two and a half years. I've uh, just finished closing my 100th case. Um, so uh, if you average that out, I do about 50 cases a year. Uh, that range everywhere from uh, extraterrestrial vehicles or what people call UFOs to uh, uh, what a lot of people call abduction cases. Uh, we're a little more uh, politically correct now or try to be a little uh, less evasive with our terms. We call them experiences now. The, I guess the biggest flap that's going on uh, in uh, the North Texas area for UFOs right now seems to be centered uh, around the Tyler Palestine area. Uh, several cases uh, reported there in the past year or so uh, with a more frequent occurrence in the past six months. Uh, there seems to be some other cases uh, in the Dallas area, uh, mostly in the uh, far northeast uh, area of Dallas County and Collin County. Uh, as far as experience cases go or abduction cases, um, I guess over the past two and a half years, I've handled maybe 10 of those cases, uh, ranging in varying degrees of uh, invasive action uh, to the witness. Most common uh, uh, observed uh, object that seems to be uh, found lately are uh, orange uh, lights, and also triangular forms. Uh, and there seems to be smaller craft that are usually associated with the larger triangles uh, that normally occur or appear to be uh, in an orb form. We generally have about an average of 800 sightings a month, and that's around the world. Of course, most of those sightings are probably 85, 90% of those are located in the United States alone. <laughs> And we have about, I mean, field investigators, we have about... Here in Texas, or...? No, all together, about 1,500, 2,000, maybe. And uh, we have to deal with all those uh, investigations and within 90 days. And it's, it's, it's a big job. So, being that the, uh, a few years ago, we had the Stephenville case, which was very rocked to the media and how it yeah. turned things over in many ways for MUFON, where do we see uh, things going with current sightings and do, do you find that we'll have something similar happen in the near future with another big case, uh, kind of a city local issue that is going to continue to change things in the field of ufology and more to come with that? Well, we, we call that a flap and we don't have any major flaps like very often at all really. And we had the uh, sightings in, uh, in uh, uh, what was that? Arizona it was uh, Phoenix. The Phoenix Lights. Yeah, the Phoenix Lights in Arizona, and then a few years after that, we had the uh, Stephenville incident. And we haven't had anything considerable like that since then. But they, and there's not a pattern that you can go by. It just happens when it happens, and we just go investigate it. But the, the, the most of the sightings that were in Stephenville were what, what we could determine to be uh, military. And uh, but there is the occasional what I call the flying Walmart that comes through. Is the, one, one mile by half a mile, platform looking machine. It comes through once in a while, but we don't know what that is. And uh, until it lands out there and says hello to us, we're, we're not gonna be able to identify exactly what it is. You think that's what's gonna take? We have another sighting and it's gonna have to be able to really convince the people that something's going on. We're gonna have to have some extraordinary things happen. More and more people are becoming convinced daily. But it's what I've always said, until everybody comes into grips with it and gets together 
and becomes one, one dominating force, like join MUFON, go join MUFON. When we get about several million members that are voting members, we can have a voting block and we can go to, to the country, go to the government with it, and they'll start listening to us. And uh, everybody's wanting disclosure, that's what we need to do. Join MUFON. Great. So if people have a sighting encounter or anything else similar, where can they go to report those kinds of okay, sightings? Okay, go to uh, www.mufon.com and they can go there and, and, and click on the, uh, the proper button and they can issue a, 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 a fill a report out and it'll go to the state director of that state and they'll immediately take care of it. Once a report is filed by a witness, uh, usually how it goes from there is that it's assigned Within about a 12-hour time frame, it's assigned to an investigator. Once it's assigned to an investigator, the investigator has 72 hours with, in which he uh, is to contact the witness and to begin to put the, the case in progress. Uh, depending on the investigator and what he deems uh, the validity of the report, um, a lot of times it can be handled through emails. Um, if it's a more serious report, uh, then the investigator will set up first via phone, uh, a phone interview with the witness, and then go out to an on-site uh, interview with the witness and do the investigation. Most commonly or frequently, of the say 94 to 95 percent of the cases that are filed or things that are filed as a report can be explained. Their aircraft, um, their satellites, uh, they could be planetary bodies, stars, etc. Uh, it's only probably less than 5% of all cases that are reported that actually end up being uh, what people term as a UFO. Uh, or what we consider a UAV, which is an unknown aerial vehicle. Um, so a lot of times also we'll get a report where someone uh, states that they have viewed an object through uh, a telescope or through binoculars or uh, have videoed it with uh, a cell phone camera or a camera and they say that it moves erratically. Uh, actually what it is, is it's more often than not a stationary light such as a star or a planet uh, that unless you have a fixed tripod or a monopod that a camera or binoculars or a telescope are mounted upon, uh, your hands will shake and very frequently that is the, the movement that someone is reporting and uh, it's not actually uh, a UFO, it's actually a, a stationary object that by hand movement it makes the object appear as if it's moving. Here's one back here I'd like to show everybody. This is uh, very common, we see it all the time. It's uh, They'll see this photograph right here, and that's all they'll see in their camera. But that's actually a bird. When you go down here, you can see that the wing patterns, if you take the wings off, you have that elliptical object that everybody sees. So we see this all the time. Anytime you see a photograph and this has is this is in it, that's a bird. Even though it has, even though it is elliptical. Have you received any uh, compelling images to you that find that you find more credible than maybe the there, There's one that I like is this one. You see that? The person who took that, uh, they they were anonymous, didn't want to, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. They just took the pictures and turned them in. But this is in Wisconsin about ten years ago. That's really the only one I, I've ever seen that uh, really, if I was going to say if there was an authentic one, that would be it. The interesting part about this photograph is right here, that light is so bright that it just kind of blocks out the, the limb in this area.
And the circular area here, there's no, no pixelation. It all blends in. Many times when someone tries to fake a picture, they do the overlap and the splices and things and the pixelation, you can, you can determine the pixelation and the, and the perimeters. But this one doesn't have one. But that's my favorite pick. You know, one of these days, someone's gonna come forward, finally, and uh, say what the what the programs are that uh, the government is doing and what the government is hiding, but uh, that's we're no we're close to that anymore, not yet anyway. But uh, we have noticed that since Hangar One has aired since last year, uh, we're starting to get people coming out of the woodwork that that want to talk about it and uh, show things that they've had and they've hidden for a long time. And a couple of uh, government people in the military are coming forward. And uh, with their stories, and uh, you know, one of these days we'll get down to the to the, to the crux of what's really going on. But uh, it's not any time soon that I can tell. It's simply because everything has remained hidden. It's going to stay hidden until there's a voting block, like I said, to get out there and really wake them up. That hey, these people are tired of it. They want to know what it is. We're not going to know anything. Steve touched on a point that, that I find interesting in my investigations. Uh, oftentimes when I contact a witness and I begin to interview them, uh, some of the first statements that they make are, well, you're going to think that I'm crazy or, you know, I, I can't believe that I'm going to tell you that, what I'm about to tell you. Uh, so there's uh, still a little bit, uh, it's changing, but there's still a little bit of reluctance uh, in witnesses to uh, come forward and uh, express what that they uh, have experienced or what they've uh, observed. So until some of that stigma is removed, uh, they, the government will still be able to use a lot of disinformation for uh, some of the programs that, uh, and some of the vehicles and aircraft that uh, that are out there in the in, in military or government inventory that are frequently and commonly mistaken for uh, extraterrestrial craft. Uh, it's been one of the tools of, of the government and the military for some time now to uh, use Uf uh, the term UFO. Uh, to keep a lot of their projects in secrecy. And it's understandable to, to some extent, uh, but a lot of the time I feel that uh, that's part of what the problem is, is that the government has used this as dis disinformation to keep a lot of their covert projects from being publicized. Do you think it's an effort to militarize space and future space programs? To, you, to be used as a catalyst to say that this is a threat from an outside force that we need to prepare against in some way, as many people seem to ascribe. Um, that's possible. I would, but I would say that there's an awful lot of space out there, and so there's uh, in a symposium um, in uh, Las Vegas that we had back in uh, 2013. I believe they had. Uh, they have proposed that there's possibly 64 different species that have visited uh, here on Earth. And uh, if you took a room full of, say, 100 people, or take a room full of 64 people, some of those people are going to be nice people, some of those people are not going to be so nice people. So you're going to run into the same thing out there. Uh, you know, not all ET is bad, but then I believe not all ET is good either. For people that have older and previous experiences that are years back and there's something they remember quite well, it doesn't seem like there may be too much that they can do to report about that in the sense that if there's a new sighting, you can go to MUFON or a number of other places to report it. So with the people that have experiences in the past that are now sort of seen because this is a more outspoken topic now, 
uh, what insight can you provide to them to have their experiences shared and made more well known so that they're not being suppressed like it's been for many years? Even though it would be a historical case, I would still say please step forward and report it. Um, if you, I worked a case last year. Um, of uh, what would you would call an abduction experience. It uh, occurred back in 1965. And uh, after I received the report, I began to do the investigation and began to look back into what had occurred. I found that at the time that uh, this witness uh, had had this encounter, there was a, a major UFO, what we would call flap, in the in the North Texas area, uh, in the at the end of uh, July and the first of August of 1965, and um, that sort of gave that witness uh, when I concluded my report and in my interview with them, that kind of gave them validation that made them feel better about things because it was like I really did have this experience and I really am not crazy and uh, it was kind of helpful and, and helped them with some closure. So uh, even though it will end up uh, in a file as a historical case, uh, it's still worthy to come forward and, uh, and file a report. The radio show is uh, every Tuesday, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Central Time, and uh, it lasts for one hour, and it's on KGRARadio.com, and uh, that's, uh, I'm booked for two months, and uh, uh, I think one of them is going to be the Texas UFO Radio Show, I think it's a, it has something, it doesn't have anything to do with MUFON, but uh, most, of the, most of the radio shows have to do with MUFON, and uh, I'm kind of getting away from the paranormal talk, but I'll, I'll throw that in once in a while. On the, on the Texas show, we talk about anything and everything. That happens to be a common theme here in Texas. We have a lot of different alternative paranormal yes. issues. What does it seem to be about Texas that draws all of these great things together in this place? Because in some states you just hear about UFOs, and others you just hear about Bigfoot and cryptids. Well, Texas has it all. It seems. What do you think that is? I don't. I don't know. Unless just a lot of people migrate to Texas and more than they do anywhere else. So we have a mixture of uh, different uh, ideas. I, I guess that's what it would be. It's like a melting pot. Yeah, a melting pot of uh, ideas. Cultures and ideas. That's about the only thing I can explain on that. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of opinions. Well, thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. We'll be able to spread the word and let people know where to report their UFOs and everything else at MUFON and listen to Texas UFO Radio. So. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, there you, you go. Get on our tippy toes because he's really <laughs> smaller. Is that why the small one? <laughs> <laughs> Great. If I turn sideways, you won't have to use wire. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs>